It really is a blessing to have you back, Leslie. It's very moving to have uh, music again here in the sanctuary. As some of you know, I was recently on vacation, and a friend of mine from high school and I had some good, deep conversations. At one point, he asked me if I had any mantra or any phrase or saying that I live by that guides my living or choices. This is actually how me and my friends hang out, sorry to say. I thought a little and said that nothing in particular came to mind, and then I thought a little more and I, I kind of said, be kind. And he jokingly asked if what I really meant to say was, be kind, rewind. But we laughed a little about whether be kind should really be said, be kind, rewind. And we wondered if that wasn't really too terrible of a mantra to have at all, because maybe some way, someday somebody who uses it would say something like, well, be kind, rewind is my mantra, but don't worry too much about the rewind part. Let's just focus on the be kind. Of course, some of you might not even remember rewinding. It's an ancient ritual, one in which the keeper of the holy VHS cassette is endowed with the sacred duty to return the cassette to the blockbuster at the beginning of the movie before getting it back to the store. And if you don't know what a VHS cassette is, that is extraordinary news because that means we are reaching an entirely new generation of people, which is great. But for those of you who don't know, it's a cartridge about the size, say, a mid-length book that has two spools inside and magnetic film or tape move from spool to spool in a VHS player so that uh, we oldsters could watch movies back in the day. I've shared about this medium from the pulpit before, so it shouldn't be too new to you. And the thing about VHS tapes was that you could kind of wear them out. You could watch them over and over to the point that they lost their magnetism, or the film around the spools would thread, uh, wouldn't thre thread through the machine properly. Sometimes it's actually fun for me to ask friends which movies they watched over and over so that, uh, again, as children. If you have one that comes to mind, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Feel free. There's nothing too important that's going to be said over the next three seconds. And I know you're wondering, so I will tell you, the movie my sister and I all but wore out was, I'm sorry to say, The Parent Trap 2. Not the original, the made-for-TV Disney Channel movie starring Haley Mills as a grown-up, and of course her twin sister, Haley Mills, also a grown-up. I could recount the whole story for you, but why ruin all the fun in case you're going to run out and try to find Parent Trap 2 out there? And thinking about movies people used to watch incessantly made me remember my friend from high school who took this to a whole new level. The story he told me was that he would watch Grease, the movie musical, every day after school when he got home. He watched it so much that at one point his father thought that maybe he needed therapy because of how many times he'd been watching Grease the movie. But who can blame him? It is one of the most entertaining movies in the history of movie making. We go together like what? Rama lama lama ka dinga da dinga dong. Together forever like shubop shawada wada yippity boom dee boom. Words to live by my friends. I certainly enjoy trying to type them into my manuscript today. But movies of our childhood aren't the only things we replay and replay, are they? No. Many of the ways each one of us acts today were ways that we were taught to act. The ways we were taught to maybe react, lo, those many, many years ago. And in many ways, we are always replaying. Sorry, our, my computer is doing some funky things right now. We are always replaying some of the same stories in our minds when we then get older. I would say, when we grow up, instead of get older, but I wouldn't wish such an affliction on anybody, least of which a congregation I care for so much. Now, I am not a psychologist. 
So I would never want to get myself into a field as complex or as important as psychology or child psychology without the proper background or understanding. But here I go anyway. Carl Jung said famously these words. Until you allow the unconscious to become conscious, it will rise up to you as your life, and you will call it your fate. I'll say it again. Until you allow the unconscious to become conscious, it will rise up to you as your life, and you will call it your fate. Now, Jung was a pretty insightful person. He met with thousands for talk therapy and arrived at a lot of interesting conclusions about the unconscious mind. Amongst his most fascinating studies was, uh, amongst his most fascinating studies was his take on the archetypes present in culture through shared or collective unconscious with others, with a society, so that underlying what many of us see as the story of our lives are actually characters, beings, or energies that will or will not behave in certain ways, directing us to mimic the ways these characters or archetypes react to the world universally. We're not going to go too far down that road. But even if this work, this fascinating work, was the only way Jung hoped that people would differentiate the unconscious elements of their being and their actions and their makeup from the conscious elements, it would be remarkable. But I hope that any psychologist out there will quickly correct me if I've wandered a little too far from an up-to-date assessment of Jung's work. Because mostly what he considered, in this way or others, was what we do consciously and what we do unconsciously. Now, a child myself, especially around middle school, I had some secrets. Mostly they had to do with who I'd prefer to spend time with and how they looked and how how they looked made me feel. Usually at that time, the most attractive people I was meeting were male, and that was a little scary in the 80s in Texas. So around the same time, I started lying a lot about everything. It became a bit of a habit for me. I would do anything to be sure no one was getting the whole picture about how I was feeling, about who I liked, and about who I liked to see. It was not particularly conscious. At least it stopped being conscious at some point. But it ruptured. This lying ruptured a lot of my relationships, even at an early age, with kids catching me in lies. My folks not being able to believe virtually anything I said for a period of years. And later on in life, when I reversed course and became almost obnoxiously honest and revealing, Someone explained to me that lying to others is like trying to play God. You're literally trying to change someone else's ultimate reality or their objective reality, which is work usually reserved for deities or supernatural beings. But this isn't surprising. In the least, it's not surprising for a young person to try, is it? I know that parents here can remember when your kids started to figure out what lying was. It's a weird thing, too, because kids are terrible at lying. But they try it all the same. When we are children, we feel powerless over so much in our lives. Everyone seems stronger, seems taller, seems more knowledgeable. So there are ways that children start to try to gain a tactical advantage in life, a way to feel a little less at the mercy of those around them. After all, cuteness only gets you so far. Trust me. Sorry. But like a lot of shortcuts in life, dishonesty ends up causing more trouble than any advantage you gain. For instance, when I was a young attorney facing some really horrific adversaries, there were times I was so tempted to withhold something damaging to my case or to maneuver for some short-term advantage using dishonesty. But the head of our office, here in, there in New York, his nickname at the firm nationally was the Senator because of the respect he commanded and the poise he always showed in court. And the Senator would never let me get away with it. He'd always say, it's better to just let everything out and trust your skills and the law that it is on your side. And he was right over and over and over. 
And in short, what he was talking about was something central to a life that has any much meaning at all. Integrity. Now, integrity is sometimes thought of as honesty or saying what one means. It has a lot to do with speech. Yes, that's one way to think about it, but it means a lot more than that. Integrity is about interconnectedness and harmony. When the parts of each of us are integrated, when they go together, that is when a person can really enjoy life in ways that those who lack integrity cannot. Integrity is exactly what Jung was trying to get his patients and those who study his theories to find. To allow the unconscious to become conscious is one of the most important ways that integrity can come to be in a person. Those patterns, those habits, those skills even that we might have started to get in childhood to deal with a world so hard to manage, so unfair to navigate, lay and languish in the unconscious mind, rising only when called upon into our lives, and as Jung says, and we call that our fate. His argument here is that many of us go through life allowing the unconscious mind, those habits, those unchallenged perceptions of reality, to resign us each to our individual fates. And he devoted his life to trying to stop it. Now, there are critiques of Jungian psychology and philosophy, which are completely valid and have the added benefit of being written in just the past decade with the help of significant advances in neurobiology. And many of these advances tell us that our brains are actually a lot more animalistic than we care to acknowledge. That our unconscious mind is still looking for poisonous snakes in the grass right ahead of us. And so it's only natural that we have to yell at people for not putting the dishes correctly in the dishwasher. Now, I'm only half joking, but those two things are kind of related. But nothing in any recent research I'm aware of tells us that trying to pull more aspects of ourselves into concert with other aspects of ourselves isn't a good idea. And yes, there are things we can do all on our own to make that happen. We can talk to therapists. We can talk to ministers. We can read more young, I suppose. And we can even yell about the snake in the dishwasher. But in my short life, Nothing has helped me come to terms more with myself and my needs and my wants and my unconscious mind than close, caring relationships with others. And the community we are in right now together, if it never serves us in any other way at all, is one of the finest examples of ways to practice integrity, of making conscious the unconscious, of bringing life the thoughts, the dreams of a people should have been making the unconscious conscious. You can only do so much. After all, this is your church. This is a playground for the soul, friends. And I dare say it could one day be an amusement park for your soul, for your spirit, for your psyche, depending on which of those things makes the most sense to you. And it is time now to start reimagining what this community can be for us all. And when I say all, I mean all. Because like it or not, you are part of this community when you say you are. And wherever this community goes, we go together. Plus, imagining is really fun. Now, the first image I have in my imagination is the image of me standing out in front of the church on a Sunday morning and never having to tell any child of this world, of any age, that they can't go to something in the church because that child happens to be in a wheelchair or has some other mode of mobility that makes stairs impossible. And I've already seen some very compelling and workable plans to make this dream a reality by keeping all activities on Sunday mornings and other days of the week on the ground floor. Wherever we go, we should go together, my friends. 
The second image I have in my imagination is the image of a network of caring, dedicated, and experienced members of the church ready to care for those suffering losses and pains and grief, expanding the ways of caring for every child of every age of this congregation. So it's with great pride and excitement I officially announce our community's new care team. We already announced the accomplishment of Nancy Schilt and Martina Quint and part of their training, but also Lorraine Fay, Joan Schumacher, uh, Carolyn Eaton, and Carla Allison have joined Martina and Nancy to make up this six-person care team. If there is something on your mind or something that comes up in your life you feel you need to speak with someone else about in a confidential and caring setting, the members of this team have been trained and are willing to hold space to be present with you. You do not have to shoulder and should not shoulder life's challenges alone, friends. Wherever we go, we go together. And the third image I have in these dreams of a reimagined tomorrow in a way is a way of thinking, a way of wondering, a way of being together that places this church's future, the world's future really, places at the center of that the children in our care. Squarely as a part of every conversation about the future of this community, the land it cares for, and the spaces we all gather should be the children of this community. And I say this not for the benefit of the children, friends. I say this not for the benefit of those children's parents, friends. I kind of say it for the benefit of their grandparents because my mom didn't raise a fool and you never get between a grandparent and the happiness of a grandchild. But mostly, I say it for all of us. And I say it as someone who cares deeply for the future happiness of this entire community and the future happiness of every single one of you. So much of the pain, the confusion, the wanting and needing so many of us still feel today comes from experiences, from ways we were treated, from discovering how hard the world is to manage that we had when we were children, small children. And speaking now about the spirit, caring for children, creating ways for them to flourish here, and reimagining a place that would draw families to this place, showing kindness to the generation that we need to save this hurting world, will be time, will be energy, will be love well spent. Because it is good for the child we still are, each and every one of us. And bringing the needs of that child we are into harmony with the adult we have convinced ourselves we have to be in this world is part of how we practice real integrity. Part of how we balance the parts of ourselves and bring out the unconscious of those pasts, those hurts even, and those pains, and heal them in some measure with conscious attention to the young children in our lives, in our very midst. On my break, I saw six different high school friends. I was speaking with one of them about the things we did in high school together. And one of those things was a dance we did as backup dancers to beauty school dropout in our school's show choir. And he didn't even remember doing that dance. It was just me and two other dudes, him and one other guy. We practiced that dance at his house a lot. And it brought down the house whenever we did it. Now, it could have been because the incomparable Kanita Miller went to our high school, who starred on Broadway in a number of shows, including The Color Purple, and she was the lead singer for the show, but I'm sure it had something to do with our dancing. <laughs> but there we were, dancing right behind her, I promise. And when I sort of mentioned this to him, I was shocked about his inability to remember that he did this dance with me. And he replied, and I know his childhood well, he replied, it's not so much that I forget things about that time, it's that I've repressed them. Friends, until you allow the unconscious to become conscious, it will rise up to you as if it were your life, and you'll call it your fate. The fate of too many in our world is dictated by the spooky realm of the unconscious. Our faith calls us into the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. 
What is more truthful? What is more responsible? What has more meaning than to bring into our conscious mind those springs and traps lurking in our unconscious mind, perhaps hidden or stolen from us by our very own mind? I tell you this, friends. Be kind. Rewind. Rewind and remember what it was like, what you might have lacked, what you might have loved and enjoyed even, and love this other generation into being. Care them into the kindness we want to see in this world. Give another child memories, conscious memories of kindness, compassion, justice, of love in a place dedicated to the furthering of ideas that can heal a hurting world by healing hurting hearts. Every age and every stage of every one of us, we go together. Every hour of every past and every hour of every future, we go together. And every chance I have at a dazzling tomorrow and every chance that you have of the same, we go together. For let us never forget the sacred words spoken so long ago to all who would listen and want to be part of something greater than any one of us can be alone. Ramma lamma lamma ka ding a ding a dong. And if you weren't sure about anything I said, don't worry. Just be kind and rewind. And may it ever be so. Blessed be and amen. <laughs>